So you guys, thanks so much for showing up. And, um, I thought maybe we'd have more people who had signed up to show up, but um, we're going to get started anyway, because we're like three minutes late. So um, the restrooms are out the door and to your right, and there's also a water fountain out there. So I'm Alicia Doran. I'm the Invasive Species Management Coordinator for Jeffco, and I'll also be your speaker tonight. I'd like to introduce you to Carly. She's one of our new hires. So the first full-time um, invasive species management specialist that we've ever had. And so she's been um, working for this team for about a month now. So be nice to her. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to be talking about uh, noxious weeds. And are we live on the internet? Sure are. Already. So, what we'll cover tonight is we're going to talk about the weed law. We're going to talk about impacts of noxious weeds. We'll do some ID on some uh, common weeds that are, you'll probably know most of them. And then we'll talk a little bit about control efforts. So, what is a native species? When you probably, when if you've talked about noxious weed, you've heard the terms native species. Well, those are organisms that have been here in, in a particular region um, since pre-European settlement. Oops. And then non-native species, of course, is the opposite of that. They're uh, not known to have been here uh, pre-European settlement. They're from other continents or other regions of North America. And you'll also hear terms like exotic species or introduced or alien or foreign. And that's all mean the same thing. And so we'll talk about native range as well. And so um, there are some things that are known in certain parts of North America but not in other parts. An example of that are monarch butterflies. They're native to the eastern part of Colorado and on the west slope of Colorado. They are not native overwintering population in Jeffco. So when people are telling you plant milkweed for the monarch butterflies, keep in mind, they're not meant to be here. If they're living here, and if the milkweed that's also not native to this region is living here, it means that other things that are supposed to live here don't have as much room to live. So keep that in mind. The base of species is any organism that's not native to geographical region. But we kind of talked about that. It was officially defined by an executive order by Clinton. And, then, and so it's an executive order. And so Clinton was the first one to put it into effect. And then Obama changed it a little bit, but it's still in place. And so it helps define what an invasive species is when all of the federal government agencies who deal with invasive species are defining the work that they do. So what is a noxious weed? A noxious weed is actually a species, a species of plants that's been designated by regulation. The weed is basically just a plant that's growing out of place. So what are the impacts? Noxious weeds cost the U.S. approximately $150 billion a year, and that includes both control costs as well as losses in production. There's over 100 million acres that are invested here in North America. And on a global scale, it's over $1.4 trillion. And so it's like every continent on the face of the earth are dealing with invasive species of one sort or another. So, and approximately 42% of the friend and endangered species are at risk due to being displaced by invasive species. So we've kind of hit on this. 
they displace native species, they take up space, they use resources, they reduce food for wildlife and livestock, and some of them can change environmental conditions. So they affect desirable species, things like agricultural crops and horticultural crops. They impact natural processes, like how water moves through the soil, how soil stays on the face of the earth, changes the shade, changes how fire moves across the landscape. Changes our recreation. It changes um, access to recreational areas. It changes um, the, the types of animals and fish and insects that live in a, our waters. It changes what wildlife will come and visit particular waters, changes our access to our favorite fishing hole. And so how did they get here? Intentionally, some of them, they were um, brought in as ornamentals or as medicinal plants or as crops for food or forage. And then a lot of them were also introduced as restoration plants. They were planted on purpose. Some of them unintentionally. They came in as contaminants, see, or in contaminants and hay, or in the old days, they would use just dig up a bunch of soil in the homeland, throw it in the bottom of the ship as balance. And then once they got to where they were going, they'd unload that and dump it out. And a lot of times that would have either seeds or root fragments and or plant fragments, and that would also introduce it to our landscapes. So there are federal agencies that deal with invasive species and noxious weeds. There's state agencies. There's local government, both the cities and the counties. And then there's weed and pest districts. There's also lots of different agencies that uh, do education. We depend a lot on our land grant universities across the North America to provide the research and the recommendations on how to deal with these um, invasive species. And then there's a lot of nonprofit, non governmental agencies that also work on these problems, things like nature conservancy or things like the Colorado Noxious Weed Association. So lots of different agencies and some of them, you wouldn't even think that they would care. Things like Trout Unlimited or those sorts of folks, all of them are focused on preserving and being good stewards of the land. And of course, noxious weeds are a huge impact. So the federal law was established back in 1975, and it regulates plants that are coming into the United States and then some of them moving around the United States. And then in Colorado, our noxious weed law went into effect in 1990. Um, it was modified in 2003 to add um, a prior to prioritized noxious weed list. And this is the, the text of the law from back in 1990, and I'm not going to make you read it, and I'm not going to test you on <laughs> But what it requires is that local governments, both cities and counties, have to have a noxious weed advisory board. In JEPO, our advisory board is our board of county commissioners. They have to have a weed plan, and each location is structured differently. So some of them have advisory boards made up of um, their local government representatives, or some of them have um, private property owners serve on it. And what the law requires is that the majority of the uh, advisory board is made up of private property owners. Um, for counties, it has to be within unincorporated portion of the county, and the majority of them have to have 40 acres or more. And then, in addition to the state weed list, local entities can um, pass an ordinance and add additional plants to their weed list. So, in 1990, we had five weeds on the weed list. 
2023, we have 96. That's an increase of 1,820%. So as you can imagine, um, it's a little bit harder to get everywhere and to get everything addressed than it was 30 some years ago. So, um, the rules are updated every two to three years. And what happens there is they look at um, where they're drawing the eradication zones. So the list is divided up into list A, which are plants that are not very common across the state. They're required to be completely eliminated before they reproduce every year. List B is kind of a mix. Some of them are ones that are very common. Some of them are common in some parts of the state, not others. If they're not common in an area, then the state can designate an eradication zone. Let's see are ones that are common, common across North America. Um, they're no longer allowed to be sold, but they're not ones that we would do enforcement on, but they are certainly ones that we uh, recommend control. And then there's a watch list. The watch list used to be part of the regulations. They pulled it out because it's constantly changing. And it's a species that are not necessarily known to occur here in the state, or they're not quite sure how much they are or where they all are. And so they are being considered to be added to the list. Third process is that the state noxious weed advisory board makes a recommendation to the Department of Ag. They go through a species assessment, and uh, the state's noxious weed program is looking at updating that process to make it more scientifically stable. It depends a lot on mapping known populations. They talk about new eradication zone proposals. And they look at some going, yeah, you know what? We thought that we didn't have very much there, but once we finally got out to look, we have a lot. So it's no, it's too much to expect that we'll be able to completely eliminate that population. And so they may redraw the eradication zone lines. And then CDA makes the recommendation to the State Agricultural Commission, and they're the ones that enact the regulations. So there's also aquatic nuisance species that list that includes some aquatic weeds. There's seed law in the nursery law that prohibits the sale and distribution of certain of the plants. These lists are not all the same as the noxious weed list, and so sometimes they can get a little bit confusing and complicated. And so then whenever we talk about noxious weeds, we talk about noxious weed control. And so that brings in the Pesticide Applicator Act. If you're a business and you're getting paid to control the noxious weeds with pesticides, you have to be licensed by the state. And you have to employ somebody who's licensed as a qualified supervisor. And then there's the Pesticide Act regulates like how pesticides are registered in the state and that includes a review of the labels and the labels are telling you how and where and when you can use the particular product. So this is I'm on a soapbox here. I do not recommend the use of vinegar when it's household vinegar. There are products and vinegar, of course, is acetic acid that are labeled as a pesticide, but you have to use it according to the label. You have to use the appropriate protective equipment. You have to make sure that you're using it on a site that the label allows the use, and you have to use it according to the rate that's on the label. So making up a concoction with like the vinegar that you buy at Costco and throwing in some salt and throwing in some non liquid. Don't be doing that. That's really not good for a couple of reasons. Acetic acid changes the <clears throat> chemistry of your soil. Salt, you don't ever want to be putting salt on the soil where you're wanting to grow things. And so that's why I really recommend that you not do that. Anyway. Then I promise I won't be preachy after this. 
So the labels will tell you what protective equipment you need to be wearing. Most of them are going to tell you you need to wear long sleeves, long pants, shoes, and socks. Some of them are going to require that you have gloves of a particular kind, eye protection, or goggles. And some of them require that you have a waterproof apron when you're mixing and loading. So why do we have more weeds now? So population here in the county in 19... 90 was like 430 some thousand. Now it's almost doubled. Um, and it continues to grow probably at what, what is the current rate of growth? I know it slowed down a little bit, but it had been like about 10 to 15 to 20 percent some years. So those people are coming from other places. And so not only more people on the land causing more disturbance, but they're coming from other places where they have the potential of bringing in seeds or plant fragments or intentionally planting things that are not uh, native to our area that could potentially become a noxious weed if they're not already. And then we live in such an amazing location we're at the crossroads of the continent, both from a transportation corridor perspective, as well as the plains meeting the foothills. And so that creates lots of microclimates and lots of different sorts of ecosystems. And so we're not dealing with just one kind of landscape. We're dealing with lots of different types. And so the weed law requires that have to use integrated approach. An integrated approach is defined as education, prevention, good stewardship, and control. And people oftentimes forget the top three of these. They just jump to the control methods. So what do we do here at JEPCO? We do events like this. We do meet with uh, HOAs and private landowners. We do um, mailings and site visits and do all kinds of stuff to try to really engage with the residents of Jeffco and educate them about noxious weeds. Prevention, pretty simple. Make sure that you clean out your the seeds off your shoes and off your gear um, before leaving an area. Control. There's lots. There's a four different main types of control. One of them is biological, and that's using organisms to attack the different parts of the plant. There's, of course, chemical. There's cultural, using things like mulch or doing timing or reseeding. There's mechanical. You can pull some weeds, you can pull. Some weeds, you can't. And good stewardship. I love this picture. Because if you manage your cows well, you can still have nice grass, like on the right hand side. If you don't manage your cows well, like on the left hand side and down in the front, you're going to end up with a huge weed patch, which you probably don't see them very much, but down at the bottom looks like a bunch of white little polka dots. Well, that's all diffuse snap weed. Cows don't eat diffuse snap weed. <laughs> And so um, I was talking to a friend on the phone today and he was telling me that he was reading an article that in 16 square feet, that a musk thistle growing within a 16 square foot footprint takes up over 40% of the available space. And so that means that the desirable forage is no longer available for livestock or wildlife. So it also, the law also says that the control method has to be appropriate, practical, economical, and effective. So keep those sorts of things in mind as we talk about control later on. And so I always like to talk about, these are the things you need to be thinking about as you develop your weed management plan. What are you gonna do with the land? Why do you have the problem? What are you going to do to prevent it becoming reinvested? And then what's success going to look like? Is it going to be, it's going to be completely no weeds or that it's weeds 
in the next five years, you're going to chunk out your land and, and get a fifth of it each year. And what tools do you have available to you? Do you have like an ATV that you can drive out to the north part of your pasture and hook a trailer on it so it can help carry your bags when you're pulling mullen? Or do you have like a, a backpack sprayer? Or do you have like the best clippers available? So it's keep those sorts of things in mind as well. And then this seems kind of like a no brainer, but what weeds do you have? You need to know what you have and how they grow so that you can figure out the timing and what methods are going to work on them. And then how much do you have? Do you have just two or three? Or do you have 65 acres of cheatgrass? And then when do you need to treat? You can't go out in the middle of August and spray musk thistle that's already blooming. You're, you're wasting your time and your resources. And then what type of habitat is this weed growing in? Is it growing in the creek or next to the creek? Is it growing in rocky soil? Or is it living out in a nice prairie? And then do you have to get rid of every little bit of it and prevent it from reproducing that year? Or is it one where you can work on it over time? And then how do you choose the control? We kind of hit on that a little bit. It's how does it grow? Is it an annual or biennial or perennial? How does it spread? Does it spread by root or by plant fragments or by seed? Um, when does it flower? There's uh, some weeds that you probably saw coming in tonight. It's like horicars. It blooms early. Or cheatgrass, it's already going to seed. And there are some other weeds that haven't even got started yet. So, and then again, where is it growing? So we're going to focus on this list. And as you can see, it's a tenth of the full list. So, but hopefully you'll be able to take away the basic concepts and be able to translate that to other species that you might have to be dealing with. So I use the terms annual, biennial, perennial. You guys want to take a stab at annual or what that means? Seeds every year. Seeds every year. Actually, it grows from seed and sets seed every year. And then what about a biennial? Takes two years. So it starts its life early as a seedling and a rosette. And then the second year it bolts, sets flower, and then dies. And then of course the perennial, right? We all know what that is. Those are things like shrubs and trees, things that come back from the rootstock every year. I talked about rosettes. What those are, are there a group of uh, leaves that are come from a central source? Most usually they grow flat to the ground. And I use terms like pre-bolt, early bolt, and bud stage. So pre-bolt is when it's rosette and just starting to lengthen. The early bolt is when it's started to send up that center stalk, but it really doesn't have any flower buds on it yet. And then bud stage is when it's just starting to swell and put up those little flower buds. So the first one we're going to talk about today is Harry Wilbur. And this is one where um, we're really starting to see a lot of this show up in our waterways, and especially in the last two years. So it's mainly on the flatter, lower lands, but it is starting to move up higher into elevation as well. So it's uh, a list A, so it's required to be completely eliminated. It's from Europe. We've known it here in Colorado since the early 2000s. There are some native willow herbs that the leaves look very similar, but the flowers are very different. So the flowers on these guys, well, I'll get to that, sorry. Um, it's in the evening primrose family, which I don't know, I think that sounds like a pretty family. Um, it's a perennial, it's semi-aquatic, it likes to have its feet wet. Um, it can get to be about six feet tall. 
This one is so aggressive that it'll outcompete cattails. It has these bright pink flowers, four kind of fused petals that are notched. It has a very distinctive style in the middle that's white, and it's split at the top, and so it has like four horns. And so the flowers are about this size. Sometimes they get a little bit bigger, and sometimes they're a little bit small. So it has fibrous roots and it has rhizomes, which are modified roots that are just below the surface. And then it has stolons, which are modified stems that are just right at the surface of the soil as well. And it spreads by seed and by uh, root rhizome and stolon fragments. This was the uh, taken the year that we first discovered it. This is at a golf course. As you can see, all of that tan, tall stuff in the middle there, that's hairy willower. That's how aggressive it is. So how do you get rid of it? Keep it out, prevention. Um, use a herbicide when it's actively growing, best before flowering or in the fall. And the materials that you would use would be aquatic or um, herbicides that you can use in aquatic areas or up to the edge of the water. So aquatic glyphosate or habitat or milestone, which you can use right up to the water's edge. Hand pulling if it's the very first year, yeah. But if it's past a year, no. And then no other methods are allowed. So for weeds that are required to be eradicated, Biological control is never an allowed control method. And the reason why, why do you think? Because sometimes the bugs win, sometimes the plants win. And so it's always going to be a fight, never going to get rid of all of the weeds. Works well for some of the plants where we're wanting to contain and reduce the populations, but biological control will never eradicate a population. So the next one, who here has never seen Canada this <laughs> As you can tell by the map, and these maps, um, I don't have them for all of the species, but they come from EdMaps, which is a program out of the University of Georgia that's helping catalog invasive species across North America. And um, you can print out these maps and show like how, how many sites are known to occur in either in your state or in your county. And you can see us right there in the middle, right? I, do you think we have quite a bit of it? Yeah. <laughs> so it's in the sunflower family. It's a list B, so uh, control is required but it's not required to be eradicated because of course we have so much of it. It's from Europe to, it's been known in North America since the 1600s. So it's been around for a long time. Um, over 120,000 acres reported in Colorado. I think we probably double, triple, quadruple that if we were able to map every location. Again, it's a perennial. It's called a terrestrial herbaceous form. And that means that it's leafy and that its stem is not woody. It's to be, they say four foot tall. I've seen them taller than that. And I bet you have too. Probably driving in tonight, you've probably seen stalks from last year that were five, six feet tall. Forms multiple stems coming up from, it has, deep roots and then it also has running roots and um, the different roots they have different growth buds and so new plants pop up every so often and forms these huge thick monocultures it has a very variable colors on the flowers sometimes they're whiter sometimes they're purple and they sh are shaped different sometimes they're rounder sometimes they're long and narrow the majority of the patches you're going to come across are going to be either female or male. There's so much variability in this guy that sometimes you're going to find patches that have uh, complete flowers, flowers that have both male and female hearts. 
So the wind leaves are spiny and they hurt. <laughs> so it reproduces by seed and by roots. The majority of the seed falls to the ground. The majority of the seed is not viable. The majority of the fluff that you see flying around at the end of the summer doesn't have seed on it. It's just fluff, but it's out a tremendous amount of seed. And so even if it's only five to 10% of the seed that's viable, that's five to 10% of hundreds of thousands of seed. So it does spread. But like I said, most of the seed is sterile. So that allows me to sleep at night. So, <laughs> so how do you control it? Well, what do you think I'm harping on? Prevention, right? You can graze it early before it has any of the flower beds on it when it's very, very young and it's not too spiky. Um, you can mow it like on a monthly or every two weeks basis through the summer and then hit it with herbicide in the fall. Biological control hasn't been particularly effective on this. There is a rust fungus that's naturally occurring and it seems to have some great potential. So if your patch has the rust fungus on it, you're, you're very, very lucky. <laughs> so otherwise you're left with chemical. So things like, because also the Canada thistle, it tends to be in areas um, that are a little bit more moist, like in drainages or over your septic system, that kind of thing. Um, so in the wetter areas, you need to use, um, if you choose to use chemicals, use ones that are labeled for use in or near water. So the same ones that we talked about before, the aquatic glyphosate habitat, miles down up to the water's edge. If you're in the drier areas, the transline or tellar. Are a good choice for you. Hand pulling, again, not recommended unless it's the very first year and the plants are no bigger than that. And that, and by that, that's like that big. Otherwise, you're breaking off roots. Those roots go down 30 feet. They'll spread like 15 feet or more in each direction. And like I said, little growth buds along each of those roots that if you fragment those roots, something like a quarter inch of a root will give rise to a new plant and then you've started your patch all over again. Times 20. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it just feels like you're just making mad. <laughs> exactly. And so this one, uh, musk thistle, this is one that's uh, very, very common here in the area as well. This one, the flower head is uh, much bigger. And we're going to talk about three of the biennial thistles that we have in the county. And then we'll also talk about diffuse snapweed, which is also a biennial in the sunflower family. So the commonalities is they all start the first year as a rosette. They all reproduce spicy. They all have a taproot. They're all found in the same sorts of places along rights away in uh, waste places in rangeland and um, but they have a very different profile. So bull thistle, uh, we have more of it than I used to think we did, but it's not as widespread as the other two. So the flower on it is kind of this um, more purpley color. It's a base shaped. Um, the bottom of the flower is face shape. It has narrow but spiky bracts, which are modifications on the seed head. Um, the must this old one in the middle, it tends to be about this big. The head gets really heavy and it tips over. Um, it's more of a magenta purpley color. And then the bracts on it remind me of artichoke leaves. They're uh, broad and they are bent down. And then the other one is scotch thistle. We're seeing scotch thistle show up in areas that we hadn't ever seen it before, and the populations are getting pretty thick. We have um, some of our neighbors on a couple of our parks have like hillsides full of it. It is um, two is more of an urn shaped flower. It's purple. It's this is the one that when you 
for talking to your Scottish relatives and they send you that ornament at Christmas time with the thistle on and this is the thistle. <laughs> so, um, the racks are narrow and sharp, but they tend to be more pointy out. And then the flowers are single on short little stems. So the rosettes are different. The rosette of the bull thistle are, is kind of a dark green. It is the edges of the leaves are very undulating. Um, the bottom side of the leaf is kind of white. The musk thistle, the one in the middle, it has very distinctive white edges to the leaves. It has a very distinctive white midrib, kind of like a, the midrib of like a lettuce. And then Scotch thistle, it has some more triangular leaves. They don't grow as flat to the ground and they're very kind of a grayish green color and very, very fuzzy. And they also kind of grow at different heights. The bull thistle maybe get to be about this big and maybe this wide. Thus thistles tend to be more single stalk. Sometimes they'll branch and have individual flowers at the end of those branches. And again, they can be six to eight feet tall. And then, but the grandfather is the Scotch thistle. We have some, they say eight feet tall in the literature. We've all seen them much larger than that. How Carly is, how tall is the biggest one you've ever seen? I see, I'm five five and I think I've definitely seen one. And so all of them have uh, wing stems and, and spiny leaves and spines on the wings on their stems. I do want to mention that we do have a couple of native thistles in our area. And this one is wavy leaf thistle. It tends to grow at lower elevations in some of the same areas that our noxious thistles grow. I tell them apart. This guy's a little bit um, shorter. The flower, the 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 colored part of the flower is more open and spread. It's a lighter, more of a lavender and white color. The flowers maybe get an inch and a half wide. The flowers seem to be bigger in proportion to the rest of the plant. Um, it is kind of grayish green. It does have those mid roots on the leaves. But this one is one that if you have it, keep it and protect it because our, it supports native insects and native wildlife. And so then the last biennial that we'll talk about here is diffuse snap leaf. This one, again, it's in the um, sunflower family. It's a list B and control is required. The flowers are very distinctive with their bracts. The bracts have a point at the end and it has these eyelashes on the side. And sometimes the, the bracts, you don't see it here so much, but underneath the spine, sometimes it's a darker spot. We also have uh, spotted nappy in the county. It doesn't have the terminal spine. It doesn't have the eyelashes. And it has usually more of a distinctive spot. And then because that wasn't enough, we have a hybrid. And the hybrids can look like either parents or it could look like anything in between. So if it has the pointy bract, I, I love it into the diffuse nap. So uh, usually has a single stem coming from the rosette and then it branches. And, they can get to be about this tall and probably about this wide. And these guys, they break off in the fall and will tumble and spread their seed uh, as they go. And if you get a bunch of these, they're strong enough that they can even like knock over a chain link fence. So it's just amazing what nature will do to us, right? <laughs> so the rosettes show up in the fall and in the spring. They're just starting to show up. This year is a little weird. Some of these things are showing up a little later. Some of them showed up a little earlier, so we don't know what's going on. So the rosettes, they're more highly lobed leaves. They look more lacy, um, and it too has a taproot. 
So for all of the biennial thistles in the knapweed, your control was number one, prevention, <laughs> and then of course, removal. The time to remove these guys are at the rosette stage or at the very early bolt before any flower bud is formed. We wanna get the top part of the root so that it won't grow back. And that way, you can just leave them on the ground. You don't have to bag them and take them to the landfill. You can, if you wait too long, you certainly can do removal when they're flowering. But with a scotch thistle, you're using one of those huge garbage bags per plant that can get a little bit expensive and it, they get heavy. And so hauling them back to your, your vehicle so that then you can get them to the landfill, it, it's a lot of it extra work that you don't need to go through if you just get out there early and do it before they form any sort of a flower bed. Don, that's another soapbox. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, and of course, the herbicides, and these will work on all of all of those, the biennial thistles and the napweed, 2,4-D plus dicamba, or tail or transline, they have the same active ingredient, milestone, Tellar or Escort. And again, you want to get it in the fall at the rosette stage or in the spring before they start to bolt or that very early bolt stage. If they are looking like this, don't spend your time spraying them. It's, these are going to die anyway. When, and once they have any kind of swelling in their flower bed, those seeds are going to germinate. And so spraying them at this time is going to kill the foliage. It's not going to stop the seed. And um, so obviously you're just wasting the materials and your time and effort. Foundation toad flax. This one's really, this one's one of the ones that showed up early this year. And this one this year, we seem to have a lot of it. So it's in the snapdragon family. Um, it's a perennial reproduces both by seed and by root. It too has a spreading root system, but it also has a really hefty tap root. It's required to be controlled, it's on the list B. Flowers are about three quarters of an inch wide and about an inch long. They look like snapdragons. The leaves are egg-shaped and they're attached directly to the stem and multiple stems come from the root crown. And they're kind of a grayish green color. Um, treat pre to early bolt in the spring, or really the best time to treat it, and it's more effective in the fall. And um, sometimes they recommend that you wait until after the first frost. These the leaves on this guy are very thick and they have a very waxy cuticle, and so by having that frost event, it helps break down some of that cuticle and it allows the herbicide to penetrate those leaves a lot better. Your choices are a little bit um, slimmer. So the 2,4-D plus dicamba, probably not the best choice, but um, if you have this like in a, a garden, landscape, garden, ornamental, planters, that sort of thing, that may be your only choice. Um, otherwise, if it's more of a rangeland, the escort or the plateau works well on it. There's also a very, we're finding this biological control agent has been very successful. We're really excited that the populations on the trials that have been put out are really starting to increase. So there's hope down the line. So um, these are available. You can get on the waiting list with the State Department of Agriculture. They have an insectary out in Palisade, and then they also have a team that work from our side of the uh, the range. And so you can get on the waiting list, and if they get enough beetles, they'll sell you some. So uh, it's always a I always encourage using an integrated approach. If there's three or four methods that are going to help you. Uh, take advantage of it. I, again, a native that is blooming, and sometimes it tends to bloom earlier, but this year I think it's going to be a little bit later. It's called Golden Banner. 
different plant family. This one's in the pea family. And so it has a very distinctive pea flower. Colors are the same. The fact that it has like a two part flower with a lip on it sometimes confuses people. But this one too, remember peas always have leaves of three. So um, that's how you tell it apart. And again, this is a good one. Sometimes people, ranchers prefer not to have this on their property, but if you have a, a naturalized area, this is a good one to have. Leafy spurge. This one I think we're going to have quite a bit of this year. So it too is a perennial. This one's in the spurge family. It has uh, latex in it that can be caustic. And so it's not one that wildlife or livestock prefer to eat. Though goats will eat it and can help um, work as like a mower with legs is what I call it. So yeah, perennial required to be controlled. Flowers can be about an inch wide. They're the distinctive kind of a yellow green color. Um, the leaves are lance shaped. When the seed pods uh, ripen, they have uh, this gel in it that when they ripen, they explode and they can expel the seed out to like 15 feet or more. So very adaptive. And then it has uh, roots that go down very, very thick. Remember what I talked about the Canada thistle roots and how they have little buds? This one makes that look so windy. It's like these guys, you can spray it with herbicide and it will take that herbicide and kind of like exclude it out. And so the herbicide only maybe goes down a certain distance in the roots. So very well adapted for um, survival. So you, you need to outthink it. So the best time to treat it is in the fall. And again, um, it's when it's taking all of those food stores that it generated in its leaves through the summer and taking it down to the roots. And so that helps get that herbicide down further into your roots. And it too is one of those success stories for biological control. There's a complex of three different species of aphthona beetle, and then there's another beetle that had been very successful and very successful in our area such that most of the patches that you come across already have beetles on. But what did we say about biological control? Some years the beetles win, some years the plants win. And so those years where the plants are winning, you can go ahead and maybe add some more beetles to that population. Corn topweed. This is one that is a list A eradication species. It um, we found more of it in the last two years than all 18 to 20 years before. This one has me scared because, as you can tell, if it's growing in tall grass, it's kind of hard to see, and especially because when it gets shady, those flowers close up. It reproduces by seed and rhizomes, and I'm getting to stay here. It also has stolons. Flowers are about three quarters of an inch wide. It's dandelion shaped, very distinctive color. We only have one other plant in Colorado that has that bright orange daisy-like flower, and that's a native called orange agosaurus. Its leaves are very different. It's more linear leaves. The leaves are more of a gray green. These guys have, um, their leaves are, at, are basal leaves, so they grow right at the root crown. Have some reduced sleeves up on the stem, and it has these very narrow stems with these groups of those orange flowers at the end. Control it. Herbicides are really our only choice. And this guy, it, I, I know when Fourth of July is coming because that's when this one starts blooming. So um, spring to early summer, if you know where it is. Like if you discover it late in the year and aren't able to treat it in the fall, go ahead and put some flags out so that you know where to go in the spring to get a head start on. And then in the fall, and the materials that are curtail of transline or milestone. Um, not a lot of voices in this one. It I know some locations they've treated religiously every year and it still comes back. So those the seeds on these guys, 
have that little parachute, just like a dandelion, and they do fly and they're small. And so they get carried quite a ways. So um, this is one that if you find it, um, please let us know. And this one, um, you're gonna find it more in the foothills. We're not gonna find it in the lowlands of the county. So just to kind of recap on, on the perennial weeds, pulling or cultivation is not recommended unless it's the very first year because it breaks off those roots and gives rise to new plants. And of course, right, for every wall, there's an exception. Myrtle spurge. <laughs> Who here has never seen myrtle spurge in Jeffco? So it's everywhere. We have over 700 known locations of it, and I would imagine, um, and that's just in the unincorporated portion of Jeffco. So it's a perennial. It reproduces by seed and also vegetatively. Um, it, I, I have a lady out in Evergreen that said, oh yeah, my neighbor gave me some cuttings and I just threw it down my hill and here we are 20 years later and well, my hill's covered with it. This is one that had been used as ornamental. It had been planted intentionally in um, xeriscape gardens, rock gardens, and of course, best laid plans, it's now escaped and it's covering are remote and very, very steep hillsides outside of here in Golden and down in parts of Evergreen. So it's a bad So it is required to be completely eliminated. Flowers are about an inch wide. Leaves are egg shaped. Um, the stem is trailing and the multiple ones kind of coming off of, of the central um, root crown. It says that maybe eight inches long. I've seen them way longer than that. So, and it has the huge deep taproot. The taproots can be like this thick on the older plants and they can be like this long. And then they have these lateral roots that it sends out as well. And this one too, when the seeds ripen, just like leafy spurge, they'll expel 15 feet or more. So, and I am convinced that this one is being moved around either by birds or by small birds because it shows up in places that, how did it get here? So it, it's a mystery to us. So how do you get rid of it? You can, this is one that actually removal works really well. Probably best to do it before it flowers because that way um, plants are much smaller, easier to dispose of. I say that you need to bag them because it has the potential of uh, growing from those stem fragments. Please wear protective gear. The, the latex in this is toxic. It will cause severe rashes or even blistering or even blindness. So make sure you're wearing good, heavy, sturdy rubber gloves, long sleeves, for eye protection and then wash yourself with soap and water after you've handled it. So this is the perfect time of year to be spraying it. Use uh, 2,4-D plus dicamba or glyphosate. There's newer formulations of 2,4-D that uh, work well on their own. There's material called hardball. And it, it, the chemistry is a little different. You don't need the dicamba with that particular product. So who here loves common mullen? <laughs> oh, it's so pretty. The birds like it, right? <laughs> well, the native birds prefer the native plants. So anyway, see, I said I was going to be off. <laughs> right now again. <laughs> so um, how common does it look like it is in the West? <laughs> so this one, um, is the list C, it's from Europe and Asia, Northern Africa. It was introduced in the 1700s and it seemed to be moved um, by the early explorers and because people as then they came and started settling our area because it was already here. They thought it was native, not knowing that it was introduced. So um, this one also has the added benefit that it's a host to agricultural pests both insect pests and um, fungal pests. It's in the big worm family. It's a biennial, so 
when it looks like this, perfect time to go out there and dig it up and make sure that you get the top part of that root. With the fuzzy leaves, what do you think um, spraying it's going to do for you? Maybe a little bit challenging. Maybe it's going to be a little bit hard to get that penetration to the leaf surface. So we recommend that you use what are called surfactants. So they're spreader sticks. And they change like how the water spreads on the surface of the leaf. And some of them ha are, have silicone in them so that it helps it stick on the leaf or penetrate or, or withstand the UV light a little bit longer. So these guys, they usually grow as a single stem from the crown. It has these very, um, I think, they were, I hate to admit this, you cannot repeat that I said this. I think it's kind of pretty. <laughs> Um, it has these spiked flowers. Um, they sh the flowers start blooming in June to October. And it, like I said, it has a tap root. It reproduces only by seed. And, but these the seeds on this one can last like over 100 years. So it's a, it's a tough one. And this is one of the ones that it's one of the first ones to show up after a fire, after disturbance. So we have quite a bit of it in the county. Prevention, it's easy. Don't be uh, cutting the seed heads when they're brown like this because you just the salt shaker effect. <laughs> um, and um, a lot of times when it gets to this point, the seeds have already dropped, so you're wasting your time. Um, removal, when they're small, when before they have any kind of a flower bed on it, you can, like I said, dig them out, get the top part of the root, and leave them on the ground. Um, or you can treat it with herbicide in the spring, right when it's starting to elongate. So when after it gets any taller than this, you kind of missed your wind. Um, you can use the milestone to the water's edge and then tell her. So this one's a little bit tough to kill sometimes. So, but the, um, the more you stay on it, the more progress you're gonna make. So I don't wanna discourage you. And it's certainly one that um, from an aesthetic perspective, it, it's nice to get rid of. So what are you going to do? Here you learned all this stuff today, and I'm going to make you go out and be um, eat warriors for us. If you find something that's not on our list, report it to us, please. Uh, monitor your land. Get to know what's supposed to be on your land and what's not supposed to be on your land and where it is. Um, address your homes early. And by early, I mean when your populations are small, and then also early when your plants are small, so that your timing will give you much more effective control. Encourage your neighbors, right? How many of you have neighbors that have moved in the last five years? Right? We've had a lot of new people move into our area. Not everybody's heard this talk. And so a lot of times people are used to maybe seeing some of these species in parts of the world where they come from and don't realize that here in Colorado, they're ones that we want to get rid of. Or they think they're pretty. Well, yes. <laughs> I mean, that's common neighbor conversation in my neighborhood. It's like, but they're so pretty. You know what? So what do you say back? But there would be other prettier things. <laughs> That's the right answer. <laughs> so, and then, right, I've hit on this like a million times tonight. Consider prevention. Prevention, seriously. Was it Ben Franklin or did he just repeat it? Uh, you know, can he say, does a penny earned? You know, it's like the more you can do to not have to control things, the better off you're going to be. You'll have much more time to go do the things that you really enjoy doing. So, um, we have this uh, landowner's guide developing an noxious weed management plan. You can download that off of our website. Um, and then also I have fact sheets for all of the weeds. Um, if you just go to the weed identification page over on the left or the different uh, weeds, or we also have thumbnails where you can hit on it and I'll take you to an uh, information page that will have links to the fact sheet for each of the weeds there. So this is my contact information. 
please feel free to read it out to me if you have any questions about what we talked about here tonight or if something else comes up. And um, now we have time for questions. I have some questions. Sure. So we have several the biennial type of evils. And I've noticed like those common teasels. Mm -hmm. If I take just the top three or four inches of the taproot, mm -hmm. silly, they will still set up little like offshoots from that taproot. So how much of the taproot do you really need to get on? I think on, on teasel, I would go six to maybe eight inches. Okay, so for the thistles, the biennial thistles, three or four inches work. 